So next up will be Andrew Tritt at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Andrew, you have a chance to share your screen and check your setup. Uh, yep, can you hear me? Yep, very good. Okay. I can see your All screen right. too. So that's good. What, oh, you can see no, my actually, screen already? No, I just see you already. Sorry. I'm oh, yeah. The background. Um, so the background first. Okay, can there you see you that? Yep, your Bluetooth config. Oh, no. Now we got no. you in. Oh. Uh, For a moment, it looked like a presentation. Okay. There we go. Do you see presenter mode or? No, we see your mode. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we see presenter mode. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, so originally, I was going to talk a lot about neurodata without borders, and I'll I'll kind of talk about that. But I thought it would be more interesting to talk about the underlying infrastructure that we use to to build neurodata without borders, which is um, uh, heavily modeled uh, the HDF, uh, HDF5. Um, and so first off, I'd like to start by motivating uh, like what we were trying to do here. Um, and that's really sort of enabling community science. And so how does, where does uh, data standardization come into this? Well, you have these two scientists um, and they, you know, <clears throat> they have uh, their own data that they store and they, they store it in their own weird little esoteric format. Uh, and so they go to uh, <clears throat> they go to exchange that format. Um, they can't really read it. So, you know, Dr. Red has been built all of the software infrastructure on these these red triangles, and when he gets uh, blue rectangles, he can't read them. So, you know, what are they going to do? They can't they can't use that data, and they, they have to spend a bunch of time and overhead um, to uh, convert their data convert it and try to understand it. So what we try to do here is um, uh, provide some sort of standard that uh, they can use to exchange data and then, you know, test hypotheses that they found on different data sets and you know, uh, combine data. And so, so that's really our motivation here is to provide um, a stable target or sort of uh, a standard that um, scientists within the same within the, the same scientific community um, can use for for doing community science, um, and so this really this effort to build HDMF, which underlies MWB, really came out of uh, this motivation to uh, design some standardized format for exchanging data within the neurophysiology community. Uh, so neurophysiology really focuses on these dynamics. Uh, of groups of neurons, um, and there are many ways of measuring them. Um, so electrical physiology and optical physiology, behavior, and even simulation data. Um, so we had to come up with a standard uh, <clears throat> that uh, could encompass all these different mod data modalities. Uh, so one of the the central challenges is like bringing all these experimental scientists together um, and to identify and separate all these their different concerns. Uh, to enable um, community to really communicate and design the standard effectively. And, and out of that, um, you know, we, everyone has different needs depending on with, with how they use their data. And so we had to develop this, this infrastructure that was sort of modular and flexible and can be uh, uh, adapted uh, depending on the different need of the different needs of the different scientists and, and what they're when and how they're using their data. And, and as well as across the whole data life cycle. So data takes different forms depending on where it is, and, you know, whether it's acquisition or pre-processing or analysis. So um, to sort of satisfy the needs or to, to build their data without borders, um, we had to develop this sort of underlying ecosystem that we've called the, the hierarchical data modeling framework, uh, which is sort of the majority of what I'll talk about in this, in this talk. Uh, and we've really, you know, HDMF really separates data into these four different pillars. Um, so uh, sort of central to this is this sort of data standard schema. Um, and to, to formally 
to find such a thing, you need really a specification language. Um, and then all of this is to define how your data is stored um, in, a, in, a, in a, a data storage backend. And then, of course, you want to make this data accessible to uh, the, the users of this data. And so you have the data APIs that lay on top of this. Um, and uh, throw the I'll throw this talk, I'll sort of fill in how all these different, you know, we separate all these components and we have different layers within this, this uh, framework. And uh, I'll fill in this, this little diagram here on the left, um, to show how they all relate to each other. So the first thing that we, you know, sat down to, to, to build is this design as a format specification language. And um, the purpose of this was to give some sort of, give a way to formalize the data model in a human and machine readable uh, format. Um, so, you know, we, we set out with HDF5 as our target um, for many reasons. HDF5 fits the needs. Uh, and so uh, the components of this specification language really model what, what's going on in HDF5. Um, and so the main components of this, this language are, you know, ways of defining or object primitives for defining objects, ways of specifying data types. Uh, and then a way to specify or compose these data types into uh, namespaces uh, for, for dissemination of a, of a data standard. And so when I say object primitives, um, really mean like groups, data sets, uh, attributes, and links. Um, I don't really need to go into these, I assume, because this is the HDF5 user group. So I assume you all know what these are. Um, and then, um, you know, you want to specify data types. Um, so whether or not you're talking about ints or floats um, or compound data types, um, and then also object references and region references. Um, and then, you know, so central to neurophysiology is, is time. Um, they really care about uh, activity of neurons over time. And so we you know, developed a, a custom time for storing ISO date time strings. Um, <clears throat> And so using these object primitives and these data type specifications, uh, users typically define you know, what we call uh, uh, data types. Um, and these are sort of reusable types. They're basically a class, uh, uh, um, as you would find in object-oriented programming. Um, and we've provided mechanisms for uh, for using existing data types, this data type inc. Uh, keyword and then uh, ways of defining new types called uh, or this, this uh, data type def. Um, and with these two components, you can um, define new data types and extend existing data types. Uh, and so then users will define all use the the, uh, the previous thing, uh, the object primitives and data types to uh, define object data types right, and then compose these into um, a standard which is uh, formalized in this concept of a namespace. Um, and this, this provides a mechanism for distributing and using a standard, um, which is really just a collection of uh, uh, data types. Um, and it provides ways for extending when you, when you concretized a, a standard then in the form of a namespace, you can extend that namespace um, and add uh, add new data types or extend existing data types. Um, and this just forms the basis for sharing of, so if a neuroscientist doesn't like or needs to add something, they can create an extension for their lab and then they can share that extension in the form of a namespace along with the, the new data types they've defined. Um, so here sits uh, this, this sort of specification interfaces um, and I'll, I'll show how uh, the specification language um, is used to actually define some sort of standard. Um, so what we have here is, um, uh, this is from Eddie Chang's lab at UCSF, um, and they do they record electrical cortical activity in the humans, so electrical activity in the, the outer part of the brain. Um, and they use these things called ECOG arrays. And uh, so these little dots represent electrodes that they implant on the surface of the human brain. Um, 
and they want to know where these electrodes are with respect to the brain. Um, there's within the standard, there's a way of specifying um, uh, the X, Y, Z coordinates of the actual electrodes, but they need to uh, understand what the brain looks like in those X, Y, Z coordinates. And so they want to store the surface, the cortical surface of the human brain, because they care about all these folds and I think gyri is what they call them. Uh, um, and so to do this, they, they uh, design a, they use a triangular mesh to approximate the surface of the brain and uh, to store this triangular mesh, they use two data sets, one to store the vertices of the individual triangles and then uh, they call faces, the, uh, which is effectively the, the vertices that are composed to make a, a triangle. Um, and so uh, they call this, they've called this data type surface. And as you can see, they, um, they define a new data type called surface, um, and then extends this existing generic base type we have in the NWB uh, uh, standard. And this is a group, and they've added two data sets to it, one for the faces and one for the vertices. And then they could go on and add some attributes. Um, and then they take this data type and um, they add it, or they create a namespace for their extension, and then they add this the surface data type, uh, which is effectively a group with two data sets um, to uh, this namespace. And then they can export this thing to a YAML file. So the specification language I just talked about is, is in the format of YAML. Um, and so uh, then they can you know, save this YAML or reload this YAML file and, and uh, to write data and then re uh, use it to, to read data. Um, so this is where the standard uh, specification, uh, so how it interacts with this, the specification interfaces. So next they want to use their data uh, and they effectively just write some Python classes, which we call, which we, we extracted in this concept of containers. And these are just uh, in memory representations of their data uh, they can write their own um, or uh, the user or the HTMF will, will auto generate some of them. So that's again where these containers sit. Um, so next I'll talk about data storage. So, so once you have like, your data defined, how it's going to look like on disk, how you convert from one component to the other. Um, and so we have a bunch of intermediate layers. Uh, to sort of handle all this conversion according from a, a Python object according to a spec into uh, uh, in, into HDF5, um, and so they've we have uh, designed these things called builders. And these are just abstract representations of the things on disk, so groups, data sets, links. I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and then we've we have this I/O layer which we call HDMFIO, and we provide uh, two. Um, two implementations of this abstract class called HDF5IO and ZARIO, if you like a file, a, a folder of files instead, um, but we, we uh, promote HDF5. And if they want to add a new backend, they, they can extend this, this, this guy, this HDMFIO object. Um, so now to really interact with how IO goes and happens, we have this data IO wrappers, um, which users can use to specify you know, IO uh, parameters like chunking and compression. Um, and then we've also added this thing called a data chunk iterator that users can use to chunk up a, a stream of data, um, which is useful for sort of converting their really large data sets or streaming data. Um, and this is where so they, they use these data IO wrappers, pass them into their container, and then there's this intermediate layer. Um, so the last thing is they have to convert from these containers into this, these abstract objects. And that's where this, this mapping layer comes in. Uh, and object mapper effectively takes the specification and uh, has some rules for how it reads data off of a container and writes it into a builder uh, and vice versa, how it takes data from this builder uh, that presumably conforms to the specification and, and constructs these container objects. Uh, so all these are managed by uh, what we call a type map. And a type map sort of it just maintains this relationship between specification, container class, and these object mappers. Uh, <clears throat> so given a data type, it returns the container, and then 
give it a container, it returns an object mapper, and then this build manager is sort of the instance at runtime that sort of memoizes builders and containers to maintain sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between memory and what, what data is represented in the memory and what's on disk. So this is object mapping is like the workhorse of the system that sort of glues all these things together. Um, and so how we use this in NWB, um, so we've designed, um, a, uh, I think, 20 to 30 different types of time series data types, and then uh, around the same number of analysis data types to represent all these different uh, components of the neurophysiology data across the whole data life cycle. So starting with acquisition to data processing to analysis uh, and, and storing experimental data. And we have many different data modalities like extracellular EFIS, which is where they, just like the ECOG stuff I just talked about, where they stick wires into the brain and record electrical activity and intracellular EFIS where they're taking individual uh, cells and patching into them and measuring uh, voltage changes uh, on the, with a neuron in a Petri dish. Um, optical physiology, they uh, have dyed the neurons and they can measure how they flash or how they uh, measure their activity based on some, uh, some fluorescencing, fluorescent imaging um, from calcium ion channels. Uh, and then of course behavior, you know, where the mouse or rat or monkey is and what it's doing and then simulation data. Um, so we've sort of defined, designed this standard so they can store all of this in one, in one file and distribute it and share data. And how they do that, when they they can also extend this standard, and how they do that is through and how they share their extensions is through this, this thing called the NDX catalog or the Neurodata Extensions Catalog. Um, this is sort of the whole ecosystem uh, of tools for creating extensions and sharing them. Um, and they deploy it similar to how you would deploy uh, a package on Conda. Um, with, and, uh, so users can go to the NW, uh, nwbextensions.github.io and look for what's available. Um, they can contribute extensions through making some pull requests on GitHub and uh, users can uh, view and, and, and share and uh, sort of vote and provide feedback on their individual extensions. Uh, so this is all made possible with this underlying HDMF um, uh, framework. So if you wanna know more about Neurodata Without Borders, um, please visit nwb.org or neurodatawithoutborders.github.io. And um, with that, I'll take some questions. Three minutes left. So. Great, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. That's a nice application for HDF5. Mm -hmm. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? Thoughts about it? have HDF5 on our brains a lot here. And so you can have HDF5 in your brains or about your brains or something also. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Andrew, this Super. is Ray here. Uh, I remember uh, you mentioned that you need some cloud uh, support with HDF5 data sets. Were you able to get to that? Uh, um, so, Czar has done some stuff where they they can read individual data sets in a file, an HDF5 file stored on the cloud, and we've kind of piggybacked off that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, I don't have, personally, I don't have a lot of experience with the cloud, but I know some users are, they have small labs and it's easy for them to, the cloud is an easy resource for them to use. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. They want it, but I haven't, we haven't, it, we haven't focused much on that. Um, but I think there are some people working on it. Um, so. Okay. Okay. I mean, HDF5 has uh, this HSDS server, which can use data keeping on cloud. Okay. Um, yeah, we should look into that. H, what do you call it? H HSDS? HSDS. Maybe Elena can send some links. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but actually, we also have a SWE driver. It's available in 110 and in 112 releases. It's not very performing one, and we 
uh, have some path to enhance performance, but you can use, one can use a street driver and just regular application on your client system to get to the file that is stored in S3. Okay, great. Um, well, I will uh, look out for those things. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And, uh, I think I'll thank you. Thank you. The next speaker. Thanks. Thank you again, Andrew. Yep.